Okay, welcome everybody. I thought before I go into detail about what we do with data, I thought it might be useful for you to just understand what linguistics is because not everybody's necessarily um, doesn't necessarily know about it. So what, what are we doing in linguistics? Um, essentially, we investigate language. Now, language as a, as a phenomena, that's what we're looking at. But really specifically, there are people who are looking at the structuring of language what kinds of you know, sound structures do they have, um, sentence structures, and so on and so forth. Um, we also look, and that was, uh, has always taken up quite a lot of time um, in terms of research, um, the development over time uh, of languages. How have they changed and why have they changed? So that's been always a very important issue. Um, increasingly, nowadays, people don't look so much anymore at um, development over time. It's still an, um, um, an issue that people look at, but people are more and more interested also in how does society intersect with language and what are the particular factors that determine how that interaction works. So why do we speak the way we do and why don't we change? Um, in one way or another. So, for example, um, people often say, okay, this is a disadvantage, this is a, a discriminated um, way of speaking. Why don't people stop speaking that particular way, for example? That would be one of the things that uh, people look at. Um, but there's also increasing research um, with the ling environment. How do we name things in the environment? How do we explain things in the environment? And then there's a pretty large area um, that looks at the cognitive processes of language. <coughs> so basically, we're, people are looking which kinds of parts of the brain are being activated um, when we're doing certain kinds of things. Now, when linguists typically work on language, the idea is always to say something in general about language, but in fact what often happens or what the typical case is that people look at one language, but sometimes they also look at more languages, especially typologies, so they look across different languages in order to find regularity. And one of the big debates that's always been quite um, important in linguistics is this idea of, well, is language a closed self-contained system or is it something that's part and parcel um, of culture? Is it heavily intertwined with um, culture? So that's just to give you a background of um, um, what linguistics um, is broadly about. Now, what are the kinds of data um, that we use? In fact, um, some, some students have said to me that they think, for example, that linguistics is quite schizophrenic in the sense that um, it, it looks at stuff that's very social, there's, there's a very strong interaction with society, and then there's a very, uh, um, another end that is very cognitive, okay? And that is also reflected in the way, um, or the kinds of data that we look at, and the kinds of ways in which we collect data. So when we think about the more cognitive end of, um, and the model building end of linguistics, what we often find is that people just collect single words, for example, or sound sequences, or single sentences. And they do that in different ways. They can either construct uh, experiments, so for example, they have prompts on a computer, and whenever you hear something, you just have to uh, hit a button. That's one way in which uh, data is collected and one type of data that we have. Then people also have, especially in psycholinguistics, where they look at brain scans, for example. So that, again, is the very cognitive side. And then one, um, one way in which language is often basically extracted um, is by looking uh, or by using what is called elicitation, where you basically ask somebody, can you look at this particular sentence and tell me, is it correct? But here, correct, really what we mean is, is it acceptable? Can somebody say it like that? Have you ever heard somebody say it like that? So for example, the area of, linguist of um, syntax would look constantly at these kinds of sentences, for example, something like that, pink large cats bark ferociously. Is that a possible phrase, or is it not a possible phrase, for example? Okay, So that would be one way in which data is collected. Um, but there are also other ways in which data collected, and that is the more social side of um, uh, linguistics, 
where people go um, and interview other people and ask them what uh, what kinds of uh, ask them things about their life. So William Labov, for example, um, pioneered that particular method where he came out with what is called a sociolinguistic interview. He basically had a script and asked people to um, uh, to to kind of talk about different kinds of topics. But the idea was not so much to answer the topics or to provide knowledge about these topics, but the, the point was really for a person to speak continuously so that that data could be recorded and then analyzed. Okay? So these interview, or actually we should call them the sociolinguistic, inter, sociolinguistic interview, is one large area of where we have data, for example, that would fit um, a particular resource like the library here. So in the end, so for example, for one of um, the big studies that William Labov did in Martha's Vineyard, he interviewed 69 people. So 69 people multiplied by one hour uh, interview. That's a lot of data. Okay, so that was a large area. Then another way in which um, data is connected, uh, collected is through ethnography or what is also called participant observation, where people just engage with a particular community and look at what, um, what are they doing, how are they doing things. Okay? Now, in that particular sense, what we find mostly is that people spend time in a community and they might take notes um, on a computer or in a notebook, um, but they, but they usually don't, we don't find um, actual recordings of data. So um, what people do with this kind of data is they find out what are the kinds of places where I could be recording data and what kinds of data are particularly interesting. And once they have determined, okay, what are the different kinds of speech practices within a community, then they go out and they ask people, can I record um, one of these interactions? Okay. So for example, I've um, for a long time done quite a lot of research um, in um, a community in South America. And when I first went there and um, did research in a relatively small uh, village, I spent probably about three months um, just hanging out there and trying to figure out what do people actually do? Who, what do they talk? I, I was told to go there. This is a monolingual community, but I figured out quite quickly that actually people do quite different things. And one of the things I noticed quite quickly is that they do different things in different places, and they do it with different people. So once I had quite a, a nice overview f through participant observation, I then went in and asked people, can I record these kinds of interactions? Okay. Now, one area that's becoming quite um, important now and never used to be that important um, is written um, data. So traditionally, linguistics likes to talk about, um, it likes to only use um, spoken language data because they consider that to be the most authentic type of data. Okay? But um, in fact, nowadays, we see that there's loads of data for new, uh, new media data, Twitter, and so on, that can be analyzed. But then traditionally, for historical corpora, we also find uh, letters and legal documents and so on that people analyze. So the one, the data, times of data that we would possibly be putting into a resource here in, in the library would be these kinds of data. These kinds of data are rarely ever archived. Why, I don't really know, but um, we don't find that much archiving going on. So what, just to briefly say, what do we do with these data, these kinds of data that I was highlighting here? Well, we have all of these different kinds of data, and then what we do is we look at the distribution of elements, so we go through either with particular computational tools or without these kinds of tools, and we look at what is the distribution of these particular um, elements, um, but we can also go further by not just looking at the distribution that is, well, these ones always uh, occur before nouns and these ones only after nouns, for example. But we can also look at, well, what kinds of context, in, uh, in which kind of context are they used, what kinds of meanings are they used to create, for example. And one thing that particularly Lebovian sociolinguistics likes to do is correlate um, the distribution, um, the distribution of particular elements with social characteristics. So they would be correlating that with um, 
gender, um, age, um, social class, and so on, in order to find out are there particular elements that have a higher frequency in one context than they have in another kind of context. Okay. Right, so those are so we have these large corpora, and then they um, are analyzed. Now, what are the issues? So these are the kinds of um, things that um, that we then, or what are the kinds of issues then that um, that we deal with? Now, the very first thing is interview and naturalistic data always need to be transcribed. Okay, so here you can see an Elan. Um, a piece from an Elan transcription. So basically, everything that you kind of record, you actually have to write down, and uh, you actually have to 100% match it. It it cannot be kind of um, just about uh, what you're writing down. But in order to do um, a clear analysis, what you need to do is you have to be sure that that's uh, what you're writing down is exactly what's on the tape. So you can imagine that takes huge amounts of time. And, uh, and or huge amounts of money because you might have to employ somebody to do that for you, okay? So what are the main um, challenges, what are the other kinds of challenges that you have? So for example, when I started working in the South American village, the people didn't really have a very good orthographic setup, so you have to first train them in using the orthography. Um, if it is a language that has been transcribed, for example, even something like Irish English can be quite problematic because what are you going to transcribe the way people are actually saying something or actually the way that um, that uh, it, it would be represented with the standard orthography. In both cases, you might be losing or adding something. Okay. Um, then the other um, aspects that are, in a sense, quite uh, problematic or uh, chal are challenges are also the analysis, which is very um, time-consuming as well, because you actually need to go from one instance to another and determine what is it doing in this context, what does it mean, and then basically use statistical tools in order to um, create lists and then in order to be able to, um, to match them up with um, with other kinds of meanings. Now, what are the other kinds of challenges in terms of um, uh, bringing those data um, into the public domain? Um, well, speaking as somebody who also is part of the ethics committee, the biggest issue is always that these data are identifiable. Okay. So sound data always remains identifiable. Now, a lot of people think that if they just cut off the sound, then it's no longer identifiable. It, we could call it de-identified, but it's not fully de-identified. And one of the biggest issues is you lose a lot of the actual meaning-making component. Because how would you know that something is irony? Because you can just read the text, and that sounds OK, but you wouldn't have any indication for that. So. Um, the fact that it's identifiable makes things very difficult for people for storing it. Now, the other thing, especially with naturalistic but also with interview data, um, is that it can be very personal and very private. So, for example, when I was doing my field research, um, people were often telling me all kinds of stories about other people in the village, and I even had a problem getting somebody to transcribe these things because I couldn't give it to somebody who would know about that, right? And I think the same is then true when you bring it into the public domain. You have these very personalized stories, and people might say, yeah, you can use it for your purposes, and you can present them in a, a non-identifiable way, but um, we don't want to really see them in the public domain. And that is, often tends to be quite a big problem. Um, the other issue is, especially if it's not um, English data, but um, from another language, you also have to translate and gloss the data in order to make it useful, okay? Because I can't really throw out data of a language that nobody knows or very few people know, and how will you ever um, analyze that? So that uh, costs a lot, of, oh, a lot of time and effort, and very few funders will actually be willing to pay that kind of thing. <coughs> and it is often also very difficult to, um, to use these data simply because um, if you don't have enough metadata, like explanation of the context and so on and so forth, you can't really do very much with the data. And that's always been one of my problems with um, large corpora, 
you have the problem that you can do certain kinds of analysis with them, but certain other kinds of analysis you will never be able to do. So you can do structural analysis, but probably not linguistic analysis or um, sociolinguistic analysis. Okay, so a lot of those issues obviously don't arise with written data from the public domain, but they can also arise. Right, that's all I have to say.